Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to this uh, webinar organized by EXA. And a special welcome to the panelists. Uh, I will introduce them in uh, due course. My name is uh, Martin Dorsman, EXA's Secretary General. I will be moderating this panel discussion and guide you through the webinar. I would like to start with a short introductory statement. Today's webinar uh, attracts a lot of attention. We have over 500 participants, and that shows the importance of the topic we are discussing today. Uh, some housekeeping first. Uh, the webinar will be recorded, so you will be able to see the, the webinar discussion uh, immediately after uh, we end this session. Uh, today we will not use the chat function because with the huge number of participants that might be rather complicated, also given the time we have available. Uh, but we did invite all the participants to send in their questions beforehand, so we selected a number of the questions and we will we'll use them during the panel discussion. Um, on the topic of today's discussion, uh, let me start with saying some general remarks. Uh, first of all, the, what, what is it what EXA is trying to achieve when we talk about uh, greenhouse gas emissions from shipping? And that's a very clear goal we have, and that is full decarbonization of the shipping industry as quickly as possible. And perhaps you might notice that I'm not referencing to the EU shipping industry. I uh, make reference to the shipping industry, and that's a very straightforward reason for that, because we are a global industry. Um, European ship owners uh, operate vessels globally. Uh, some of these vessels or a big part of these vessels uh, are not calling at EU ports. So we operate also as European ship owners uh, uh, globally. Uh, if you look at the business models, um, they vary quite uh, quite a lot. Uh, size of the ship owners, uh, we are mainly a small and medium sized uh, sector, but we also have the big ship owners, of course, uh, familiar to, to you. So the shipping industry is very, uh, uh, very diverse industry, and that I think will also reflect uh, on the discussions we will have if you talk about a uh, market-based measure and how to uh, organize uh, such a market-based measure for the shipping industry. Um, ultimately, we need global regulation. Uh, we think that's the most effective and efficient way to regulate uh, the, the industry. And we work as EXA very closely together with the International Chamber of, of Shipping, strongly supporting the process uh, at, uh, at IMO to make the global regulation a success. At the same time, EXA wants to be a constructive and proactive uh, partner for the EU regulators, working closely with them on the proposal to include shipping in the EU ETS. The proposal will be on the table in a couple of months, uh, and that's the political reality. And in order to have a constructive dialogue with our European uh, stakeholders uh, and the regulators, the European shipping industry must have a position, of course, on important elements of the proposal uh, to include shipping in the EU ETS. And that's why EXA developed what we call the framework conditions for an EU proposal, and today uh, we present these framework conditions. Um, I have to say that the, the conditions are not casted in stone. Some are, let me say, work in progress, open for exchange of views and ideas, and open for possible amendments. Um, during the talks, and when we talk about the proposal and we reflect upon the, the framework conditions, the ultimate goal for EXA will be, um, will uh, the EU proposal contribute to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from shipping in an effective and efficient way? That's always in the back of our mind. And I think uh, that we try to have also this very positive attitude uh, during today's uh, discussion uh, at this webinar. And, um, and that's, uh, uh, I hope that we as EXA can contribute to the process at European level and that 
that process can also contrib contribute to the process at, uh, at the global level at IMO. So for this, uh, this is my opening statement. I would now like to give the floor to Sotiris Raptis. He's the Director for Safety and Environmental Affairs at EXA, and he will present the framework conditions. One moment, please. So, Thierry, please. Thank you very much, Martin. The, uh, the topic of my presentation will be the position of EXA. We developed the framework conditions for a European market-based measure. That doesn't mean that our position has changed. That we have a strong preference for global measures. We have a strong pr preference for, um, for a global approach. Right? But we do believe that if uh, the EU um, believes that it's necessary to introduce a market-based measure, we should to make sure that international negotiations at IMO level are not undermined by an EU market-based measure and that all segments of our sector are provided with the necessary flexibility to adapt to, to any measures. And um, having engaged in this exercise, we commissioned along with the International Chamber of Shipping a study to ascertain the implications of the EU ETS for international shipping. And on the basis of the findings of this study, on the basis of the findings, on the basis of the knowledge of our experts, we went through all different policy options. The idea of the EU ETS is, an, it is, is not a new one. There is also there is already an impact assessment study um, uh, back in 2013 of the European Commission. And the outcome of this uh, technical exercise is the framework conditions, our position on EU, on an EU market-based measure. As a general comment regarding to our position, we need to highlight that um, EU ship owners control around 40% of the global fleet, but shipping is a truly international business. Ships are mobile assets. It's not like um, installations currently under the EU ETS. We're talking about a highly complex and diversified market. We're talking about thousands of ships, thousands of, thousands of owners, thousands of operators. And on top of that, small and medium-sized enterprises are the backbone of our industry. And any measures might imply a huge administrative burden for them. That's why we need a level playing field across the world. Ships do not trade only within the EU. Ships call and leave the EU, and ships connect with you, the EU with its international trade partners. That's why we need a level playing field, and we need to make sure that international negotiations at IMO level deliver. And they have delivered so far. They have delivered significant progress. We need to avoid that um, political tension is created with third countries or trade disputes or third country jurisdictions introduce retali retaliatory measures against EU ship owners. We need also to, to take into account the high risk of model shift, especially for short sea shipping that may result in increased CO2 emissions and increased road congestion. One of the main objectives of the recently announced sustainable and smart mobility strategy of the Commission is to shift more cargo and more passengers from road to sea. We need to make sure that this is happening the next 10 years. Shipping is already the most efficient form of commercial transport and has managed to decrease emissions by 7% in 2018 compared to 2008. And at the same time, an improvement, an efficiency improvement um, uh, took place despite an increase in maritime trade by 40%. This all happened while we know that low and zero carbon fuels are not available in the market, do not exist for shipping. But we have also to bear in mind that energy efficiency improvements can contribute up to a certain extent 
to the decarbonization of shipping. What is really key is to make available low and zero carbon fuels in the market. And the real question is whether an EU ETS as designed for other sectors would be fit for purpose, would make, would contribute to making fuels, low and zero carbon fuels available in the market and whether it will and whether it will increase significantly the administrative burden, especially for SMEs, distort, distorting competition in the market. Another critical element for us is also the use of the revenues. And from our experience, shipping companies haven't, um, haven't got smooth access to the EU financing mechanisms. Turning to the general principles of our position, of the framework conditions for a market-based measure, we would like to see a measure which is scalable and compatible and consistent with a future IMO market-based measure, a measure that um, makes sure that there is a level playing field in the market across all companies of the sectors, and that distortion of competition and the two-tier market is avoided. That a measure also contributes to the general and overarching objective of the Commission to shift cargo and passengers from road to sea. We also want to see that severe weather conditions are taken into account in the designing of the system and that um, early movers and companies that have already invested in more efficient ships are not penalized. When it comes to the baseline for any measures, for reduction target of any measures, we have a strong preference for a 2008 emissions baseline as, um, as it is um, the approach of uh, the initial IMO greenhouse gas emission strategy. But let me turn to three essential elements of our proposal. And the first one is the establishment of a fund under an EU market-based measure for CO2 emissions. We find it absolutely necessary uh, the establishment of a fund to minimize the administrative burden, to allow the fund, through allowing the fund to purchase allowances for CO2 emissions on behalf of its company members in an open system. And the carbon price should be properly be based on the ETS average price of previous years. The revenues the system could generate should be reinvested, all revenues should be reinvested in the energy transition of the sector. A recent report of the European Commission found that almost 80% of the revenues generated through the purchase of ETS allowances in Europe are reinvested back in the energy transition of land-based industries. And we want to see the same for the shipping sector through this fund. That revenues support R&D and innovation projects for low and zero carbon fuels, that revenues support the uptake of new innovative low carbon propulsion technologies. Importantly, that the revenues contribute to bridging the price gap between low, between conventional and low and zero carbon fuels that do not currently exist in the market. This is absolutely important if we are serious about making low and zero carbon fuels available in the market. The second essential element of our proposal of the framework conditions is the geographical scope. We support that any geographical scope should be limited compared to the EU MRV to avoid political tension with third countries, to avoid trade disputes um, with third countries and any dis discriminatory measures against EU vessels by other jurisdictions. If a fund is set up under an EU market-based measure, we should cautiously consider which part of the voyages of ships calling or leaving the EU should be taken into account. And the third um, essential point of our position is a phase-in period. A phase-in period is necessary to learn from the system to learn from the participants while a system might send the right investment signals in the market. It's, it is absolutely necessary 
in order to identify potential errors when the system is designed. And it will give it also more time to the regulators, to the Commission and the co-legislators to identify any shortcomings and to give them the opportunity to address um, those, those shortcomings. What a phasing period really means? That only a certain part of emissions from the maritime, the maritime sector are covered during the first phase of the system, going gradually up to 100%. It means that companies would be responsible, at least in the first period of the system, only for a proportion of, of their emissions. And having said that, we, and this idea is not ours. It has already been tested by the previous impact assessment study of the Commission. It was one of the policy options, the main policy options ascertained by the previous impact assessment. And we would like to see a similar provision in the system uh, when the proposal comes out. We are happy that the idea of the fund has been taken seriously. We noticed that the idea of a fund of, pool, of a pooling system that allows companies to pay for their emissions through a fund is um, in the questionnaire of the consultancy responsible for the impact assessment study and who have already contributed to this consultation. In a nutshell, a fund, we need a fund to minimize the administrative burden. We need a fund to invest back into the sector, the revenues, to facilitate the energy transition of the sector and to contribute to making low and zero carbon fuels available in the market and preferably globally. And talking about an international approach, notwithstanding these essential uh, elements in a possible EU market-based measure, we should have trust in the IMO process. Um, the IMO proce process has already delivered significant um, emissions reductions, and we would like to see that any measures at EU level would be consistent and compatible with what the IMO will come up with in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Sotiris, for this comprehensive uh, explanation of our framework conditions. I would now like to turn to, to the panel discussions, and I'm very pleased that, uh, that we have such a distinguished guest participating in our panel. So I would like to introduce them to you very quickly, and I will share another screen to do that. Um, one moment, please. Here we are. You will see the, the panelists. Let me start by introducing to you Beatrice Jordi. She's from the European Commission, DG Climate Action, European and International Carbon Markets. The second uh, panelist is Jutta Guterland. Uh, she's a member of the European Parliament and coordinator of the Group of Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats in the Environment Committee. And she will join us uh, very quickly now. Uh, there was a last an, uh, ad hoc meeting of the Environment Committee of the EP, so um, she will join us immediately after uh, 12.30. So we expect her to join in, in some 10 minutes. As third panelist, we have Vaik Abasov, Director at Transport and Environment, working on sustainable maritime transport. And finally, we have the President and Vice President of EXA, Klaas Berglund, President of EXA, and we have Philippos Filius, the Vice President of EXA. I would like to start with, uh, with the, my first question and um, that I would like to pose to Beatrice Jordi. So Beatrice, uh, hearing the, the presentation by Soteus on, on the framework conditions, um, there was reference to the, the process of, of IMO. 
And how do we see the relationship between uh, a European measure, the process IMO, is there a risk of undermining uh, the process at IMO? Uh, can, can you share your thoughts with us? Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Martin. I hope uh, sound is good and everybody can uh, listen uh, well. So f first of all, uh, a big thanks to EXA because it's, uh, uh, we are well aware from the Commission that uh, shipping is a key sector of the economy. It's uh, a crucial actor in all the trade policy. It's a job creation a sector and um, uh, so, and, and this is the first is the importance of the sector. The second is the importance of the dialogue. We are in a very active times. We are in the Green Deal. Uh, climate action has been mainstream in all European policies. I can confirm for uh, all the policies being published by the Commission and by my own stress that uh, we are working in uh, very different fronts. So in this uh, Green Deal, process that, as you know, we are presenting in June uh, a set of different uh, legislative actions to implement the 55 percent, the uh, upgraded um, new target of emission reduction for 2030 endorsed by the European Council. In this process, the dialogue with the industry and the dialogue with the sector, it's uh, crucial. So a uh, big thanks, uh, an impressive uh, number of participants. So um, it's uh, welcome also to this panel. So coming to your question, uh, Martin, uh, as uh, Europe and not only European uh, Commission, as European Union, we are uh, clear believers and actors in international arena. It's uh, multilateral relations, are part of our religion. So uh, IMO is a UN agency, world agency. We cooperate with them. We are catalyzers. We are uh, pioneers with our policies in IMO, but uh, to cooperate with IMO is a must. So um, welcome the, uh, the, uh, the basket of measures that uh, have been uh, put on the table by IMO. And we don't think that uh, to present a carbon pricing uh, goes against IMO. We see if I can put in a similar way, I mean, um, a Paris Agreement comes also from UNFCCC. It's another UN global agency. And not because we are ambitious at European level, it doesn't mean that we go against. So clearly it's not uh, black on white. I think it's a, a, a complete uh, working together at international level that the EU a role at international level is demonstrated, whatever is Paris, whatever is ICAO, whatever is IMO, and with a, an ambitious agenda. Of course, uh, we are well aware that our emissions in Europe are a part, around 10% of the world emissions, and this is why we put in place climate diplomacy, and this is why we think that uh, global cooperation is a must. So we don't see at all a contradiction. We think that a basket of measures, so first, the multilateral aspects are part of our climate policy. And second, we think that uh, the ETS is a very important instrument, but it's not a golden magic stick. It's a key instrument, but it needs to be accompanied by other measures. Thank you, Beatrice, for, for this. Uh, perhaps a question uh, in relation to this. Uh, there, there are concerns from non-European countries about uh, the, the proposal to include shipping in the UTS. I think the, the government of Japan uh, wrote to, to the EU. How, how do you see that relation with, with, with these non-EU countries and trade relations and possible uh, retaliation? Can you share your thoughts on that, please? Beatrice, did you hear me? Sorry, we can't hear you, Beatrice. Sorry, sorry, okay. Martin, I was muted. Right sorry for okay. that. So uh, let's uh, let's um, let me tell something. I mean, Japan has committed on a climate neutral economy by 2050. So we are seeing a big movement of. Uh, 
uh, strong climate ambition as we have done in the in uh, in Europe of committing to this uh, climate neutrality that as you know we are reflecting this in our in our European law and we see other countries Japan uh, China and other uh, key members I mean New Zealand joining the climate neutrality so there's a big movement there uh, that's uh, uh, what do you say on retaliation I think that uh, we we need to have a certain braveness in Europe that uh, uh, not because everybody's moving exactly at the same speed and I clarify that Japan has this uh, climate neutrality uh, agreed uh, not because every, everybody is moving at the same speed we should wait for the nearly 200 countries in the world to move so um, uh, climate change is coming part of the trade we have the border uh, uh, adjustment uh, measures on the table to be also proposed in June. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, climate change is being part of the trade agreements. And let me just give an example with the recent trade agreement that we have signed with the United Kingdom, where climate change has an important protagonism in this trade agreement. So constellations has changed, architecture has changed. Uh, climate change is not anymore a quota, but it has become part of the big trade agenda and has bec become part of the big multilateral relations. So uh, I don't think that uh, the, the, uh, the world retaliation should be something that to be overused. I think we cooperate with uh, all international partners. We re clearly cooperate with, uh, with Japan. In, uh, in, uh, in climate change, in technology, on, uh, on zero technologies. So I think that uh, we don't see risk of, uh, of this retaliation. And the, the good thing of climate change going to a multilateral and trade agenda is that there are many countries moving in that direction. We are not alone. We are not alone there. Thank you very much, Beatrice, for this uh, clear statement. And um, indeed, we see a lot of countries moving in in the same direction, and it's clear that the EU wants to be in the lead. So let me please uh, switch over then to you to Guterland. Uh, I see you're on the call. Can you switch on your camera, please, Jutta, and confirm that you're there? No, it's not working yet. I don't know exactly what's what's the issue. Then I would like to to move over to 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 fake. I, I would like to ask you, fake. Uh, we we discussed uh, the 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 lack of um, of uh, low and zero carbon technologies at at this moment, and that's of course. Uh, key to, for the industry to, to make the step to full decarbonization. We can do a lot and we are already doing a lot in our view on, on reducing emissions by uh, improving uh, existing technologies, etc, etc. But what does it take to, to make the, that step to, to, the, to low and zero carbon technologies and how to overcome the price gap? Can you share your thoughts with us, please? Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, and hello to all. Um, well, first of all, I would like to um, thank EXA for this invitation and congratulate EXA for this, with this brave step of uh, constructively engaging with the European process. And I should say that um, carefully listening to the framework conditions, as you, as you call it, I see quite a lot of convergence between EXA position and, and the position of transport environment as a representative of civil society. So I'm very glad to see this conversation happening and looking forward to, to further cooperation.